Okay, last time in our program, we started create, we did create the selection grid. And the way I visioned the use of this selection grid, and this is my technique, but again, it's something that I've used on lots of projects. A lot of customers who've seen it, who use it, who like it. So for a desktop app, this is a good way to select and see data. What I see this as is a way for me to select a record. I want to see John's pizza order for February 11th. If I want to see that, now we haven't coded this part yet, but if I want to see that, I should be able to pick it from somewhere. How do I pick the pizza order that I want to see? I might have thousands of these. How do I pick them? This is one way. My most recent pizza order is at the top. We filled this grid. We customized the grid. We'll take a look at that again in just a second. But the end goal is to be able to pick a pizza order and have John's information show up over here on the right-hand side. Now, we're not that far yet, but that's where we're going. Today, if I remember right, the next thing we want to do is narrow this list down. Imagine this is 10 years' worth of pizza orders. That may seem like a lot, but realistic terms today is computer. You have 10, 20, 30,000 pizza orders. It's not a big deal. I could filter these and just say I want to see the 2014 pizza orders. Why am I looking at 2012? Well, that's my sample data. But the next thing we're going to do is add a search box to the top here and say I only want to see Jody's pizza orders and have this grid filter so that we only see a handful of pizza orders or hundreds of pizza orders instead of thousands of pizza orders. So that's our next step. It's just a quick review of how we built that grid. We added it from the toolbox. Where's my toolbox go? Oh, right. And we went to the toolbox, went to the data grouping here and grabbed a data grid view, threw it on the form, stretched it to make lots of room, and then started customizing it. We named it grid select just to add some consistency. We also called the binding set down below here, where's my binding set, right here. We also drag that out of the form. These two connect to each other to provide us access to the database. This binding set is a critical factor in us filtering this a little bit later. So we put both of those on the form, then we connected them together using this function which is in the business class. This business class function goes out and gets data. If you're not real clear on that, I think I did it twice, my advice is listen to that recording one more time. I don't want to take much more time here. This gets the data that I need for the grid. Returns it to the GUI. This is all happening in form load. The GUI then grabs that data assigns it to that binding source down here and then says, hey, you grid, you're connected to this binding source. So the binding source has got the data. The grid is connected to the binding source. We run the program, poof, magically, data shows up in the grid. The grid initially had some flaws, and we had to do that, really. We had to get some data in there before we can customize it. Because until you can actually see this data, it's hard to figure out what do I need to do for customizing. So we had to get some data in there first. Now this is all completely done, beautiful, customized. But it took some steps to get there. We got the data in there, then we started customizing it. We set the grid to be read-only so the user doesn't try to change data inside of here. We turned the row headers off. At the beginning, there were little squares on the left-hand side, just like an access to select rows. We turned those off. I don't want the user to use those, because they can use them to rearrange, they can use them to delete, they can use them to select. I don't need them. We turned them off. We don't want users resizing rows. It's amazing how frustrating they get when they resize it, make it too big, and then try to make it exactly the same size when they're done. They don't need to do that. We're just going to turn that off. We're not going to allow them to add rows using our grid. We're not going to allow them to delete rows using our grid. We're not going to allow them to select multiple rows. This grid has lots and lots of power. We're taking it all away. So that all the grid really allows us to do is select records. 
we put this command in so when they click anywhere in the row, it selects the entire row instead of just a little pieces part. So another one of those. This is all from my users coming back to me saying this grid is great, but how do I get the name and the date selected at the same time? You don't need to. Okay, never mind. Here, put this command in. Now they click on the name. It selects the whole row. They click on the date. It selects the whole row. <clears throat> all of this is pretty standard stuff. When you create your grid, you're going to copy that code. So let's go take a look at that code. Please. In my load grid, here's where I connected the binding source. Here's where I got the data, connected it to the binding source, and then the binding source to the grid. So the grid is now connected. And then here's all that customization I just talked about. The delete rows one is missing because without the selection grid, there's really no good way to delete. So that one's probably optional. If you put it in there, I won't stop you for it. So that made it behave properly, but then we started messing with the appearance of it. We can grab each one of the columns that's in the grid. Initially, we had three columns in the grid. The first thing we did is said, hey, you order ID. You're just some auto-numbered thing that means absolutely nothing. I need you behind the scenes, but don't display it to the user. So we made it visible as false. That ID number is still there. It's still attached to the row. So when I run this, this row has an ID number attached to it. It's just hiding. So the user doesn't have to deal with it. We in code will use that ID number because remember when I click on Jody's order here, I want to see Jody's details. How do I get that? Using the ID number that's hiding. It's still there. Making it invisible doesn't mean it goes away. It's still there. The user can't see it. Next thing we did is just change the title of the order date field to make it a little more professional looking, capitalized it, added a space to it. By default, you simply get the field name, order date, capitalized like this. The customer field I named in the query, so we didn't have to rename it, but I set its width. Initially, it came up at about 75 pixels, which was too narrow. So we stretched it so that we could see the entire name. With a date, we got even more elaborate. We decide, I decided that I wanted to format the date this way, other than its default short date format. Might even have had time embedded in it. So in order to format that, use these kinds of formatting things, I first have to create a style variable. This is a cell style. It's built into the language. That grid knows how to format its cells using a cell style. So this creates a new cell style. Think of it as a checklist or a template. I want blue and I want middle alignment and I want this format for my dates. And there could be all, there's all kinds of other things you can change. And Karen asked for word wrap. And there, you know, there's all kinds of things you can change here. These are the ones I use the most. And so I'm showing them to you, but you can experiment with the others. This says display the date in that format. This says align it up and down middle. Middle is up and down. And then to the left, so that the dates line up on the left instead of on the right. And finally, just for grins, we change the color to blue. Once you've defined this style, so this is a defined style. Format this way, blue, middle, middle left. And then you apply it to the date cell. So this says, make my style this style, right up here. Set its width to 85 because I want the date to fit just right. And finally, once you run the program automatically, it automatically selected that first row. That's what that last line does. That last line there says grid select, <coughs> make the current cell the first displayed cell, which is that one. And because I have the row selection turned on, when I select this cell, it selects the entire row. Before we're done, when we click on select or when we run this, the details for Eve's order on 214 will show here automatically because we selected that cell. The last thing we had to do is figure out how wide to make this grid and design view. There's no notice the columns are not there. Why not? 
we haven't loaded the database. There's no way for the grid to know how many columns it's supposed to display. There's no way. That happens at form load is when we finally put data in here. So at this point, the grid is just going, I think I'll be this big. Well, we have control over that. What we did in code, or at what we did in our brains, is went in here and said, okay, this one's 125, this one's 85, so that's 210 pixels wide. And then Volker said, add 20 for the scroll bar. So that's a width of 230, so we went into design view and manually changed the width of this grid to 230 pixels. There's, it's too difficult, it's just not worth it in code to write the code to say, add this width and this width together, add 20 more, make this the right size, and then take everybody else and move them over so they're attached to that grid. And then shrink the size of the form so it's no bigger than another. I've had good quality students in the past try to code that so it happens automatically. It's a whole program all by itself. Don't worry about it. Size this to match the column widths that you determined. Pull these over, shrink the size of the form so everything looks good. That's where we left off, I believe. And we ran it, and everything looked cool. So here's all the notes on that stuff and how to do it. But most of it's in the sample. I'm also still a little surprised how often I come help some of you, and you don't have the sample program on. It's, it's a learning experience between sample program, my notes, Google, to find answers to your problems. My sample program, as many of you are learning, no longer contain every bit of code that you need and change the number 10 to 12 and you're done. Not quite that simple anymore. But I have shown you, for the most part, I have shown you everything you need to know to solve the basic problems in those homework assignments. The good news is unit three, it's a little bit more of take that code that he just did for customizing the grid, slap it in there, change the numbers because I don't have the same kind of widths, I don't have the same color requirements, etc. You should be able to steal more code. Also had a couple people worried because they're typing, they're not typing very much, they're copying and pasting my code. Welcome to programming. If you're doing a lot of typing, you're not being very efficient. I mean, you see me do it all the time in class. I go steal a method that looks just about like what I need and slap that over here. I mean, how many times did I do that in the validating events? And then tweaked them. If you know that that's the code that you need and you need to just tweak it, that's programming. It's not type every single letter. I don't necessarily recommend that you copy and paste from my sample program into yours all the time. Though, so again, if you can recognize the code, go for it. I still am always impressed when Mr. Spock re reprograms the warp core, and he sits at this monitor that's only about this big, right? I don't know how he does that. And he's just moving stuff around with his hand, and twisting it and doing whatever he's got to do, and usually two hands, and he's looking over here at the same time. And then he pushes a button, and all of a sudden, they got 20% more power in the warp core. That's where programming's going. I don't have any warp cores yet, but that's where programming's going. Here's all the pieces parts. Put them together in a new way to do something different. So if you're typing manually, character by character, you're probably not doing it right. At least steal from your own code, and very often steal from others. When I Google, I see an example. Oh, cool. Highlight, paste, tweak. That's what programming is turning into. On my iOS class, that's about all we do, it seems like. And I think that's where you're all headed. That's what your lives are going to be like. Not a bunch of typing. So in a way, that's a good thing. Here's the 20 pixels extra. There's the formula that I use to figure out the width of the grid. you got to replace your own numbers, except the 20. And now our grid is ready to use. And today, we want to add a search box. Again, this grid, when my program is running, could have thousands of records in it, depending on the query that I write to fill it. Maybe the query I write is only for the pizza orders in 2015. Well, if that's the case, then I need to find some other technique, and we'll leave that for some other class, 
for how do I get the 2014s in here then? Different problem. For right now, let's just filter our grid. I need to make some room because I like to put my search box at the top. Sometimes I'll put it at the bottom, but I want my users to know right away that they can search this grid. To search, I use text boxes. You could copy one of the existing ones, but remember if you do, all of its event handlers come with it. I don't think I want that. So I'm going to create a new text box. And plop it up here. I'll figure out how wide to make it in a minute. I am going to steal this label because labels don't have code attached to them. I could add a new label, but I'm just going to steal this one and control drag it over here. I'm not doing very good with my control drag today. Nope. Let's try it again. Maybe I'm better off copying and pasting. Let's try control. Okay, I gave up. It's on the Mac, causing me trouble. On your Windows laptops, control drag that to make a copy of it. And then paste it. <coughs> Nothing's working for me today. Holy cow. Copy. Click on the form. Paste. Right. Oh, it's way down here. Nice place for it. Park that over here on the edge. Maybe get there. It's a good place for it. Bring this up. Line them up. Make this as big as it can be. And change the label of that to search. Or find. Don't use the word filter. Most users don't recognize the word filter. Some do, some don't. I use search because everybody understands that. You could put a little icon on there with magnifying glass or something if you wanted to. But this is my tool for allowing the user to filter the grid. Now, I haven't checked my tab order in a while. That's definitely going to screw it up. 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, in this case, instead of starting completely over, let me show you a different technique. I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to go back to the search box, and I'm going to say your tab order, your tab index is not 49, it's 0. When you do that, I believe everybody else gets bumped up by one. So let's find out. Nope, now I have two zeros. So maybe I still have to go through, but we're a little bit closer. Let's start this and see where my, in, my cursor starts out. Nope, it's in the search box, so I'm good. And then I can tab, tab, tab through the rest of my form. So my tab order, that might be a quick way to add things, but you still got to check it out. Two zeros is okay as long as they hit in the right order, and they seem to. My search box needs a name. Nothing new here. Text search. Now what do we do? The way I want this to behave, is notice there's no button here for the user to click on. That's another technique. I don't search until you hit the button or until you hit the little magnifying glass icon. When you hit the icon, then I search. That's one technique. The technique we're going to imply, imply in, in what? In, apply. apply. We'll go with that. The technique we're going to apply is as soon as the user types a letter, we're going to hide everybody that doesn't match that letter. And as they type two or three more, we just keep bringing the list down. If they erase characters, the list goes back up again. So this happens every time the user presses a key when the search box has focus. We've never used this event before, but it turns out it's the default event for text boxes. The text changed event. This event occurs every time the text changes. I double-clicked to create that. In most circumstances, for me, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Every time one letter is typed, do something. But in this search box, it does make sense. I'm going to cut it. And it is not a validation event, so it needs to be up in here someplace. Let's collapse so you can see what's going on. Text. It was pretty close.
text search. <clears throat> this method go away. Filters the grid to display only records that contain the letters, uh, say characters, in the search box. Notice it's contains. Now it takes us back, I apologize for those of you who weren't here last hour, but it takes us back to the SQL commands where we learned about wildcard characters and how to define contains. We're going to do basically the same thing here. Here's the code. It is not possible to filter the grid itself. There are no commands that we can issue to the grid to say, only show me the rows that have this data because the grid is just displaying the data. It really doesn't have it. It's just it's almost like a GUI for data. There's no way to change it and filter it. The select, my binding source, has the ability to filter, and then the grid simply reflects whatever's going on in the binding source. So what we're going to do here is let's start with this. In my program, the binding source is called BS Order Lookup or something. Yep. Notice in my notes it was called BS Select, nice and generic, so that I can reuse it in other programs. But here it's called Binding Source Lookup dot filter. We programmers understand the word filter. This says, hey, you binding source, you got all this data. Only include the records that have this that meet this criteria. Let's analyze this before we type it. In this example, it says where the customer name, which is what we do have, is like a star. In the last class, we saw a percent sign. In MySQL, the wildcard character is percent. In Access, it's a star. In most programs, it's a star. What this star represents is any number and any set of characters, including none. Here's another one. So this says anything at the beginning, anything at the end, and let's pretend that the user typed G-A-U-L in the search box. And G-A-U-L in the middle. I'm going to the board here for a second. Most of you have seen this, but for the rest of you. When we do this concatenation, what we end up with is customer like star, and if we pretend that the user has typed G-A-U-L on the filter, we get a G-A-U-L and then another star. Now for those of you in SQL class, that will look pretty familiar. Field name like wildcard character, something wildcard character. Pretty familiar. What this says is, as long as the letters G-A-U-L in that order, right next to each other are somewhere in the string, include them in the filter's results. Hide everybody else doesn't have that. The star can also represent nothing. So if it's my last name, that matches. Because this could be nothing, this could be nothing, as long as it's, G, as long as it's got a G and U L in it somewhere, this matches. This is the way I like to program my grid, my search grid. As long as it's got whatever the user is searching for in it anywhere, included in the results. Some people prefer to say it starts with, and then you take that first star out. This star right here, let me go back to my perch. <laughs> this star right here, you could take out. Also notice there's an apostrophe here. I lied. There's an apostrophe around this, just like there is in C. So here is the first apostrophe. Right there. And there's the end apostrophe, just like up there. Notice the apostrophes are inside quotes. That's perfectly legal in SQL. So this ends up with customer name, has the characters G-A-U-L in it anywhere. 
If you prefer starts with, then try starts with. In other words, take this star out. Just take it out, literally. And then it will start with that name. So, in here, the customer lookup dot filter is what we're changing. I want the filter to be equal to oops, customer. I have to use one of the field names that's in my grid. Remember, I have the ID. Nobody searches for IDs because they're useless. I have order date. Could search in there. That's the name of it. No space. Order date. And I have customer, which was calculated in my query last week. Customer like apostrophe star. When you write this in your program, you're going to steal this and change the word customer to whatever it is. DVD title, car maintenance shop, or whatever it is you're searching for. Plus whatever's in my search box. Plus the end star apostrophe. I think that's what this said, right? It assigned, oh, okay, we'll come back to that, but for right now, let's just use this. Whatever's in my search box, show it to me. So let's try. I think that's all we need. Believe it or not. There is no space between the star and the In the apostrophe here? Uh, no, if you put a space here, that means there has to be a space in the actual text. It would be space gall. If you put a space here, then it would have to be gall space. The space is a character, and that'll mess up your filter. So no, good question. There are no spaces anywhere inside these quotes I have spaces around my plus sign, but that's just concatenating. So I'm running. I have a full list here. Let's look for people who have the letter F in their name. Now watch what happens. It immediately filtered that grid. You can see that it's changed because the size of this scroll bar got bigger, which means there's less to scroll through. And they all have Fs in them somewhere. There's a Shafto, Jeffrey, Alfred. And if I wanted an FR, it narrows it even more. My users think that's so cool. How'd you make it so smart? Why is it so fast? Simple little filter thing. The thing to recognize here is we have not removed anything from that binding source. Remember the binding source, that little guy at the bottom? It's got all the data in it. It's just not showing it to us. It's hiding stuff that doesn't match. So it still potentially has 3,000 records in it. But now it's hiding all but two. And at this point, I could click on, oh, that's the order I wanted to look at. Click on it, go see its details, change it, do whatever I want to. The cool thing is, when you backspace, that's a text changed event. They all come back again. You could highlight it and say, give me the G's. Give me the GW's, aren't they? Give me the GR's. E. Geo. You just keep going until it filters down. Or until the user can see it. That's what my users normally do. They just filter until they can see their record or it should be somewhere nearby. And then off they go. There is one downside to this. And I forget the example. Hopefully I've got one in my notes. O'Connor. If I do a search for Connor, there's O'Connor. But most people are not going to search for Connor. They're going to search for O apostrophe Connor. And notice, I think my program is about to crash because it's not responding to me. There it goes. What happened? Well, I've got apostrophes here. And now inside here, there's an apostrophe. And so this apostrophe ends that apostrophe, and now uh, who's this for? Crash. Again, it really helps that I'm married to an O'Keefe. 
But if you're doing DVD title, how many of them have apostrophes in it? Schindler's List. And if you're searching, if they do a search with an apostrophe in it, your program is going to crash. The solution to that is to replace every single apostrophe with a double apostrophe. Two apostrophes right next to each other. The first one says, apostrophe, it's the end. Oh, no, it's not. This is an apostrophe inside. That's the solution. So now we have to modify our code a little bit <coughs> to handle the apostrophes. This obviously works unless you're searching for apostrophes. So I'm going to define a string variable called filter that is equal to my text search, whatever's in my search box. I don't want my user to have to type double apostrophes whenever they're searching for apostrophes. That would solve the problem. I don't want them to have to do that. So behind the scenes, my program is magically changing one apostrophe into two. Uh, by the way, string journal, <clears throat> we're manipulating a string. This is a replace command for strings. Replace one apostrophe in this string's text. That's a string. Change its text to replace a single apostrophe with two. So again, I'm right here. I want to filter, that sounds good. Take my text search dot text and replace text in it. Maybe. The way the replace works, there's two versions. There's the old character and the new character. The second version uses strings. Here's the old string, here's, here's what I want it replaced with. So here's the original, here's the new. I want an apostrophe, and I want to replace it with one, two apostrophes. So if I type in O'Connor, behind the scenes my program's going O apostrophe apostrophe, and that solves my problem. But I have to use this filter here instead of what's in my text box. This doesn't change what the user types. This is simply not what they see. Rephrase that. It takes what they've typed, if there's an apostrophe, and it replaces it with two apostrophes so that the filter works properly. Please. So now when I search for O'Connor, doesn't choke, doesn't crash, it finds that apostrophe. That's one of those, that's why you paid your big money for the class. It's a technique that I've shown you how to deal with apostrophes in lots of different places. Sometimes you double them, sometimes you put a backslash in front of them, but those apostrophes are just nasty. <laughs> Cause all kinds of trouble if you're not careful with them. But now my search is working and is there anything else I want to do? This command will come in later. I better type it or I'm going to forget. Grid selection change. That's an event. Selection change means the user picked a new row. We're going to code that probably next. It's commented out because we haven't written it yet, so this calls it. This says pretend like the row changed. Why would the row change? Look, that wasn't the first one that was there before I started filtering. The selection has changed. Right now it's Eve, and now it's O'Connor. It changed. If we don't encode, tell it to go pretend like the user did it, it won't update over here. We want this to always match what's selected over there. So that's what this next line is going to do, but we're not quite ready for it yet. So I'm going to put it in there so I don't forget. GRD select, I don't even know what it's called, selection changed, I think. So grid select underscore, oh, yeah, you can't copy and paste it, so I won't either. <laughs> underscore, ah, it's not my day for typing. Shouldn't have pizza before class. Selection change, parentheses, no, no. I'll explain what that does again when we get there. I just want to put the placeholder in, otherwise I forget and it's in a different place in my notes. 
So before I move on, this does all my filtering, seems to work. If you look at this code, what do you have to change for your program? John, any idea? I'm looking back there. How much of this do you think is going to change? Well, what are you doing for the unit three? You decided yet? DVDs. DVDs. Are you going to be looking for customers? No. No. Are you going to be searching though? Yeah. Are you going to call in your search box? Text search would be a good name because then you don't have to change and steal mine. What are you going to call your filter? This will probably be different, right? Because you're Binding source, that little guy at the bottom of the screen, you probably give him a DVD name instead of order. Please do. And this. He's going to be searching titles, right? I want to search for a DVD. How do you search for DVDs? By title. Types in Lost, and he gets Lost in Space and Lost World and whatever other Lost there are out there. So you get to steal most of this code. And if you steal it and paste it, you'll get an error on this because you probably won't have a BS order lookup. You'll have a BS DVD lookup, or car maintenance lookup, or whatever it is you're doing. So you'll get an error on that. You go, oops, you got to fix that. This is the one you got to think about. Though. Because if you run this and you have customers in there and you don't have anything called customers, your program is going to crash when you try to search customers because there's no customer field. So very little to steal there. If you name things, the same thing I've named. I don't have a problem with that. Recognizing that this is exactly the code you need, except for that right there, is a good sign. Questions? Okay, let's see what's next. So here's a bunch of explanations of all that stuff that I just explained. Stars or wildcard SQL commands. And then this command we'll get into in a little while, but there's the O'Connor test. All right, it's a good place for a break. When we come back, we're on to the next phase. All right now, I can filter this. Right, cool. I want to see Alfred's this order, what I want to happen when I click on this, I want all the details for that order. I already know the name and I already know the date. But what if I misspelled Alfred's name and I want to tweak it? I can. What if it was the wrong date? It wasn't 2011, it was 2012. I can change it. I can look at all the rest of this stuff. Before we can change it, we got to display it here. And so what we're going to do when we come back from break is when I click on a record here, we're going to grab that ID number that's hiding. We're going to go out to the database and say, go find me pizza order number 117. How many 117s are there going to be? One. It's an auto number field. There's only one. So it's going to go get that. We're going to write the code to suck the entire record in to the business class and then display it on the form. Take 10. <coughs> 